Welcome back, everybody. And I am super thrilled to let everyone know that we have Sai joining us again. As some of you who have been following us from day one, Sai gave us a bunch of awesome wishlist ideas, things that could and should be built before the next Bitcoin having. So last week was the business inspiration. And this week, Sai has generously offered to take us through a walkthrough on how to get started on some of these wishlist projects. Hi, Sai. How are you doing? Excellent. How about yourself, Albert? Um, Thank you. I'm doing, I'm doing great. We, we're already 30-something um, talks in. So this is, uh, you know, again, thank you so much for your support. Uh, the Bitcoin Olympics hackathon could not be the same without you. Um, today, I, if I understand correctly, you have some exciting stuff to help the builders get started on some of those wishlist items. Um, but before we get started, can you do a quick intro about yourself again for those of, for those in the audience who are just joining us for the first time? Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, I go by Sci4. My name is Brandon, though, if you are a traditional names person. Uh, I am prior military, and then after leaving the service, I spent about 10 years doing freelance software development and hardware uh, integration type development. Uh, since the recent change in ordinals, though, I had been in Web3 prior to that, and I made the pivot over and have been involved since the very start of February. So it's only been about two and a half months, not even. Um, the world's going very quickly. It's great to have everybody coming over to Bitcoin and building these amazing high-level applications. And I'm thoroughly convinced that all of you will end up building things that push the industry forward as well. Like there's there's so much space for excellent products right now that I, I have high, high hopes and expectations. Super, super. Thanks so much for that reintroduction. And also, uh, we we do see you in the Discord, and it looks like you've gone through some of the, the uh, idea videos. Um, what's your first uh, initial reaction to the ideas that you've seen so far? So I one out of the I've watched about probably four or five of the videos so far. I have not seen a single video that I wouldn't want the product built. And that's an excellent sign because if this is the the salvo before you've even built it, the fact that all of these are strong enough ideas to stand on their own, some of them have amazing business potential, uh, monetization aspects. Others are things that will push the industry as a whole forward or just make it easier for people to be involved. And that last one is of particular interest to me because I'm a firm believer that the way forward as a community of people who have a somewhat shared interest through Bitcoin uh, is that we make it easier for everybody to do it. Uh, I say it all the time. My goal is that your grandma can use Bitcoin in a safe, secure, and uh, trustless manner. Yes, um, I'm looking forward to that day. And this is exactly why we've invited you. And this is exactly why we have the Bitcoin Olympics hackathon. So we can make better and better products. So it becomes easier and easier for people to join the Bitcoin revolution and build the sustainable Bitcoin economy together. So with that said, how about how about we uh, jump into your session? Um, can you give us, um, before you start getting to technical details, can you give us a quick refresher on some of those wishes ideas that you would like to see built before the next Bitcoin having? Absolutely. So uh, as I just said, a large part of my priority list is that we want to make Bitcoin easier. And this includes ordinals. Uh, ordinals are Bitcoin as far as I'm concerned. Now, with that in mind, there's a lot of ways we can go about this. We could focus on the UI UX. This is an amazing opportunity where we are at least five years behind on UI UX in the Bitcoin world. We have some really cool toys and tech that are, they're at a level where they're competitive, but they just don't have the UI design that we're seeing come out in the last couple of years where people are really pushing the limits of what a front end engineer can do. Um, and then there's low hanging technical uh, challenges. So that's a front end. Now we'll talk about back end for a moment. Things like the how you process transactions and not process at a blockchain level, but process at a wallet level, at a library level. Uh, if I hand your wallet a PSBT, you can just go from bytecode and sign that with your private key 
but would be a lot better would be to have a library there that would take that PSBT and break it down into human readable chunks. So instead of saying, hey, 0011D4, we could say, ah, you are going to transfer this many Satoshis or Bitcoin from this address to this address. Very precise, human readable, so easy that no matter how little experience somebody has with the technology, they can understand that my Bitcoin is going here. This is coming to me. Oh, this is an inscription that's coming to me from ordinals. Now you have this uh, this very refined way to bring more people in who won't ever learn what hexadecimal is, uh, you know, which what we typically are encoding that or base 64 for these PSBTs. There's no need for them to learn that. We can completely bypass this entire technical barrier with one excellently written library. And that is that is power right there. Um, and then the final thing I would love to see is just anything that makes the it easier for a user to understand the flow of their funds and their inscriptions for that matter. Uh, right now, because we use, uh, so your wallet doesn't have a singular address if you're coming from the Ethereum world as you'd be used to. Instead, we have multiple addresses. And this is excellent for privacy reasons. It means that I could spin off a new address anytime I wanted to make a transaction with a new person. Or I could make a new address anytime I wanted to make any new transaction. Um, but this can really obscure and abstract the flow of what's happening with your funds and your inscriptions. A simplified way with maybe an XPUB to follow that flow in that uh, usage and acquisition and maybe even if you wanted to really push the limits, handle the generation of tax documentation for countries like the U.S. that have capital gains tax. There might be an aspect there that I, I wouldn't know how to explore, not being an accountant nor a business major in the past. But there's value there that could be found by somebody who had those, those fields of expertise under their belt. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Anything else? Any other wish list items? No, no, my wish list is is infinitely long. That's why they yeah. had to be kind of uh, open ended, right? Yeah, no, th those are plenty. Th th those are all actually. You, you mentioned several genres of great ideas that all these should be built either before the Bitcoin having, or you know, if we do envision a day where there is a sustainable Bitcoin economy, all of these um, sooner than later need to become realized, right? Um, because this is a group effort, it is collaborative, and this is also one of the exciting things about this hackathon is that the Bitcoin Olympics has brought together people from different tribes of thought in the Bitcoin community globally. And so we're looking forward to this kind of cross-pollination and to see the, the fruits of all of our labor. Um, with that said, let's, um, let's uh, give you the stage and you could do screen share and perhaps um, help us jumpstart um, some of those wishes ideas, like how, how would you go about getting started? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I, again, because I left a lot of these more open-ended, uh, I'm going to keep the, how do we go best about, uh, finding in the information data and technical aspects we need to do this sort of project. So the first and foremost thing is if you wanted to get into the deconstruction of PSBTs that I was talking about, and, uh, to be very precise at a technical level, a PSBT is a partially signed Bitcoin transaction, meaning that we can have individual parties sign separately in a way that we can only sign for the parts of the transaction we agree with at each part, and then have a final transaction that only contains things we've all agreed to. And this allows very safe transactions like selling an inscription, for instance. Um, so there is in the Bitcoin repo, uh, this is, I believe, Bitcoin Core's repo off the top of my head. Uh, there is a doc, there's documentation on PSBT from a high level standpoint, high level technical standpoint. Alternately, uh, BIP 174 is all about PSBTs. It is a dense read. Definitely make sure you've got a cup of coffee before you start. But if you make it through this and you've understood it, you will be ahead of almost anyone else in the field of PSBTs at this point. Um, it also, and this is an important part from a developer standpoint, 
includes example cases, things that should fail the heuristic of when you're doing your generation. So known bad issues like, ah, oh, this has an invalid global transaction key or an invalid witness script. Um, these make excellent tests, unit testing, uh, even end-to-end -end testing, could, you could integrate these to a very limited extent. There are also some successful expe expected outcome tests you can do that they include here, including a full process of building, validating, uh, and signing a PSBT. This is excellent because it would allow you, if you want to take the time, you know, you had a, a little bit of time to do your development here, you could not only have tested your software to make sure it's perfect, but you could even know what your expected outcomes are. And then because you've seen how it's been constructed and built out here, you would be able to more easily understand how to deconstruct this back to the best way to express it to a user. Interestingly enough, this is one of the few cases where the use, usefulness of a writer is readily apparent. Um, a lot of people who, who do like technical writing or even uh, more creative or fun writing, uh, they think that software development is this thing that's locked off to them. Document writing is one of the most valuable things we can have in this space because a, de a developer like me, a developer like the ones that will likely be on your teams, they can go and write code for days. But if they didn't write any documentation, that code is only as good as them still being around to help people figure out what it's doing or other developers struggling through it. Whereas all it would have taken was one really good document writer to ask the right questions during development and write those things down and just take a note of them and then write them up nicely. And that would allow a future developer to come in, look at the code base, read the documentation, and instantly understand the objectives, the reasoning, the logic, and move forward very rapidly, allowing them to get much more uh, more production in terms of improving both your product, if you're open source, or the ecosystem as a whole, if it's a matter of them using like a closed source library of yours or something like that. Um, additionally, I brought up making things easier. Uh, this is one where I think it's kind of, oh, sorry, no, these are out of order. Let's jump over here first. If you are looking for another practical example of PSBT construction and usage, uh, Oren is an absolute genius, and I highly recommend uh, his open Ordex, but most importantly, it uses PSBTs. So you now have a literal example uh, marketplace using these that you can easily look at his constructed PSBTs and look at the site and know, okay, so this is doing this. And now that makes it much easier to disambiguate what is happening within the PSBT so you can learn how to deconstruct it within your library in the most optimal manner for people to understand what's happening with their assets. Um, and then this goes back into what I said originally, where making things easier for people is important. So I happen to love BIP39 as a technical user and a uh, power user, as some people would say. It generates 12, uh, 18, or 24 character or word uh, mnemonic phrases. However, maybe this isn't the most optimal way to generate your entropy if you're building a wallet for a specific demographic. Maybe the word list included isn't optimal. Uh, I do believe there are word lists for almost every one of like the regional uh, priority languages. However, maybe you're maybe you want to generate a word list for a language that doesn't have one currently. This uh, bit thirty nine would be the basis for that. It would also be the basis if you were going to expand on this to create your own way of generating entropy, whether that's some sort of uh, signing using. Uh, say social media style sign-ins to generate a key and then use that plus a password to generate the entropy to generate a private key. This isn't optimal. It's far from it. But 
if combined with a multi-sig, which is another option when making the world easier for people who won't be able to do the technical aspects themselves, imagine we could generate a multi-sig for your grandma where she only has to sign in with Facebook, her password, and then it's a secured multi-sig because there's already a key stored on the device. So you've already got two of three plus a recovery key that she wrote, wrote down when she created the account. So now you have a two of three multi-sig. This is well above the average user security. Um, and it's recoverable to a large extent. If she has the device in the backup, she can recover it. If she knows her password, her Facebook login, and the backup, she can recover it. Um, this avoids a lot of the pitfalls that will affect these users. So I brought up BIP39 specifically, though, because it's just about generating entropy. And if we can come up with better ways to do this, not from a cryptographic standpoint, we're not going to, you're, you're unlikely in the scope of this hackathon to have time to, you know, rewrite the entire uh, current field of cryptography. But maybe you could come up with a way that's very practical. Because practical cryptography will win out in the long run, and it will also make excellent products that will, one, do well in competitions like hackathons, but more importantly, be either revolutionary in the space itself or be very profitable for you in the long run. And I know those are usually the two most strong motivating factors that drive people to be involved here. Um, and then I guess the the most important thing I can say even if none of this resonates with you, I know there are other speakers out there. Find somebody who's found a problem that they feel strongly about or a problem you feel strongly about and just build it. Because a lot of times the process of starting will very quickly show you that you do have an opinion or an idea that's really strong and really powerful. It may not be a sharpened sword ready to cut its way into the market, but you very often find that raw piece of metal when you're trying to build something that doesn't resonate for you. So give it a shot. Like even if you aren't ready today, just try because I guarantee you'll find something that works for you and you'll do excellent on it. And you'll make things really hard for everybody who has to judge at the end of this when you've got an amazing product and we're having to compare it to every other amazing product all at once. Um, and I think that's about it for me.